South Wales South Coast. Thank you. Very kind of you. Um, as you all know, it's the epicentre of web development activity in Australia. <laughs> <laughs> I should tell you that I work for the Australian government, but perhaps because they don't entirely trust me, I'm obliged to tell everyone I'm here independently. <laughs> With that disclaimer aside, I want to tell you a little story. And it's a story that's probably familiar to anyone who's worked on a large-scale corporate site, but I'm hoping it might be familiar to anyone who's worked on any scale project. If any of you haven't, you're probably wondering what's going on. Okay, so like any project, this one starts out with a simple plan. Let's begin our story in 2011. <laughs> Imagine you're starting a large-scale corporate project, and hypothetically, let's say this one involves consolidating three large government websites. Hypothetically, of course. <laughs> you might think to yourself, this project is an excellent opportunity to start with a clean start. <coughs> Only valuable content will be migrated, everything will have a purpose, and everything will have a place. You have a fresh design, comparatively minimal content, and a strong strategy. Basically, it's glory days. In mid-2011, this is what it looks like. <laughs> you have 351 lines of CSS, 120 pages. You have no PDFs, and you have one project manager. You can't help but weep when gazing upon the logical structures of the CSS and the clean minimalist market. <laughs> Everything is good. You follow the VM like CSS methodology, and you have a robust framework. Nothing can stop you now. <laughs> but then it's all of a sudden, in late 2011, responsive design explodes in your face. I hate the buttons on Max. <laughs> it's now early 2012. In the corporate world, you were an early cab off the rank when it came to the responsive design. You were clever, and you started with the mobile first, and then added media queries to make it work on larger devices. Even though mobile first wasn't really a thing yet, at least not the concept it is now. So to the casual observer, it looks like you hit a moving target. But our CSS has taken a hit. There's now 1,221 lines of CSS, 32 PDFs, 497 pages, and three project <laughs> managers. <laughs> You came out of it okay, but the past is going to catch up with you even more. I hate the buttons on Max. <laughs> In late 2012, the legacy websites start to be decommissioned. All of your well-laid plans start to fail. Bits of content that were not important enough to do anything with, given more than 12 months' notice, are now suddenly critically important. And you will not convince anyone now that it's being removed, that this is not the single most important piece of information ever published. <laughs> it solely defines the internet. <laughs> so concessions are made, rooms are added to our little shack. A margin here, a colour there, maybe a border. After all, what harm is one more class? <laughs> and with the ravages of time, this is now what our site looks like. <laughs> Our little shack now has 92 rooms. Meanwhile, we have 9,586 lines of CSS, 3,290 pages, 541 PDFs, and the project managers are just missing in action. <laughs> now, does this problem sound familiar to anyone? Yes. Okay, good. Good, I'm not alone then. Alright. Um, you might be asking yourself, what did you do wrong? And I think, well, possibly nothing. Time and people were your problem, and they will both change things. But how can we prevent the mistakes of the past? How can we configure a front-end development workflow that will give our project, our code base, some chance of lasting? And I think that the answer starts not with a grunt plugin, but with our thinking. It's an old thing, but I think you need to define all of your visual components properly. But that might not be what everyone thinks. It's not simply identifying the header, footer, navigation, and other components. Designer Brad Frost has coined a term he calls atomic design. I don't know if anyone's heard of this, um, but basically it says that, um, that you define the base level elements first, which he, Brad calls atoms. They can be uh, inputs, paragraph tags, basically any HTML tag, but also animations, um, uh, breakpoints, or anything less tangible. Um, and the idea is that you can combine different atoms to make components. So in this example, a paragraph tag plus an image plus time, and yes, there is a time thing for HTML, um, that gives you a comment block. So, um, whether you like the metaphor or not, I think building on this type of modularity in our workflows has some advantages. Um, 
at the moment, we're really good at being modular in silos. So most, and that's probably for good reasons, but most websites have um, a CSS folder, a JavaScript folder, and maybe a resources folder or something equivalent at the root level. The problem is um, that doesn't really gel with our modular thinking that I was talking about before. And it's this separation of concerns versus this modular thinking that, that we're kind of struggling with now, I think, as things become more um, you know, web components, I guess. Um, but uh, the good news is we can build a bridge between this modular thinking and our shoveling of CSS in the trenches. And if you haven't guessed by now, the answer is workflows. I want to focus very quickly on two elements that every um, CSS developer can improve in their own workflow. Um, but it's not going to cover everything. There's such a plethora of tools at the moment. It's literally incredible, and this is an attempt of mine to kind of rationalise them. There's desktop tools, there's a lot of them running the Node.js ecosystem, but if you're not a developer, there's browser plugins, there's pre-compilers, there's, um, you know, JS hint, CSS hint, lint, tons of stuff. It's really exciting at the moment. Um, good thing is, we can build um, our doc well. The truth about documentation versus is that it's a luxury and a burden a lot of the time. But we can build into our workflows processes to generate this documentation, and that's really exciting. Automatically generated style guides are often referred to as living style guides, and they're some of the best tools I think that we have for fighting CSS bloat and the ravages of time from my story before. Packages worth looking at, I think, includes uh, Style Doco, KSS Node, and Grunt Style Guide. Each of those generate uh, style guides from CSS comments, but it's also worth having a look at how the Bootstrap library generates its documentation using Jekyll, a static site generator. So I'd encourage you all to have a look at those things. And the other one I think we can all improve is, um, oh, and yeah, living style guides will help fight below if we did that. Um, so testing is another huge pain point for people. And I think a lot of you perhaps think that uh, testing is something that's just for JavaScript and backend people. And this is not the case at all anymore, and this is really exciting. Um, my workflow now often includes automated markup and CSS validation, and even some elements of user experience and usability testing can be automated. There's a fantastic library called Base um, by our very own Christopher Giffard, who I think was going to be here tonight, but I think he's not. Um, basically, you can use Base for um, testing just about anything in, in the front end, and the way you do that is very much like CSS. It's instantly familiar to anyone who knows CSS. It's a fantastic library and worth checking out. I would also check out Phantom and Casper and Huxley. Huxley can perform, perform visual regression testing using screenshots and it's pretty accessible to non-developers. Um, but if you want to man up and write a bit of JavaScript, I would uh, recommend um, Phantom and Casper. You can script just about anything in an invisible um, WebKit browser. Um, it's great for testing. Um, and that's pretty much it. I think um, automated testing gives you the cons confidence to update those components and know what's happening basically. Know that there's no shared resources, um, you know, everything's going to work for you. Um, and finally, sorry for going a bit long, but in conclusion, I think the front end development landscape has changed immensely in the last few years. Um, it's hugely diverse and it's sometimes complex, but it's more accessible than ever. And I hope I've encouraged some of you to have a look at it and have a think about it. As a final word of advice, I know it's easy to think if I can't do all of it, then I'll do none of it. But I challenge everyone to look at their workflow and find one area that they can optimise and find a tool that can do that and implement it. So thank you. Thank you.